the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. We conclude our coverage of Campaign 2010 this morning with the contest for the United States Congress in Ohio's first congressional district, which covers the central and western part of Hamilton County and a portion of southwestern Butler County. This is an unusual race in that both candidates have served in this office and have records that can be checked. The current incumbent is Steve uh, Driehaus, a Democrat who is completing his first term in Congress. Prior to 2008, Mr. Driehaus served eight years in the Ohio House, worked at the Community Building Institute at Xavier University, and volunteered in Senegal as a Peace Corps volunteer. His opponent is Steve Shabbat, a Republican who held the seat from 1994 to 2008. Before serving in Congress, Mr. Shabbat served as a Hamilton County Commissioner and as a Cincinnati City Council member. He is a lawyer and early in his career taught at St. Joseph's School in the West End. Welcome to both of you, and from this point on, it's Steve. <laughs> so, Steve. No Thanks, confusion. Man. So let's begin with jobs. And Steve Driehaus, let's begin mm -hmm. with you um, as the incumbent. The stimulus bill, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, 7.2 billion dollars, mm -hmm. 4. Point, or pardon me, 2.4 billion of that in tax cuts. Mm -hmm. From the vantage point of 2010, looking back on this, was the stimulus a well-conceived and a well-implemented program? Well, the stimulus was designed to stop the hemorrhaging. You know, you've got to look at where we were in 2008. In the last six months of 2008, the economy lost three million jobs. In January of 2009, the economy lost 750,000 jobs. The idea was to stop the hemorrhaging. From that perspective, it absolutely worked. You know, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that we either saved or created about three and a half million jobs with the stimulus. It provided necessary support to states for Medicaid and for education funding. Uh, you know, we put money into teachers, firefighters, uh, police officers, and, and I think these were very smart investments. Could we have done a better job of strategically investing in infrastructure more than we did? Yeah, I think we could, and, and I and others argued for that. Uh, however, in terms of what it was designed to do, in terms of stopping the recession, it absolutely achieved that. Steve, what do you think? Well, I disagree. I think the uh, stimulus bill was a waste of a lot of money, $814 billion at last count. Um, President Obama had said that if they passed this bill, uh, we wouldn't see unemployment go over 8%. It was about 7.6% at the time. Uh, it's over 10% in Ohio right now and 9.6% nationally. So an awful lot of money spent. And unfortunately, what, what uh, the President did was basically punt the ball over to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and you had a bunch of these committee chairmen who had bent up or uh, pent up desire to spend other people's money uh, and you know these so-called shovel ready projects which the president just admitted a couple of weeks ago that there's really no such thing as a shovel ready pro uh, project and much much of the money was just wasted and, and it's unfortunate. Well, it, I think it's important to point out if you're going to call tax cuts spending then we've got to call the Bush tax cuts spending. And that's spending of four trillion dollars over the next 10 years for the extension of the Bush tax cuts. So if we're going to start defining tax cuts as spending, then let's be fair across the board because he's describing a third of the stimulus, which were tax cuts, as spending. And so let's talk about the Bush tax cuts as spending and foregone well, revenue. Well, um, if I could respond, Mr. Driehaus, is, Mr. Driehaus and his party have been calling tax cuts spending for a long time. I disagree right. with that. I, I disagree with that sentiment. If they really wanted well, to, if they that. really wanted to energize the economy, they could have cut taxes across the board on every. Everybody. My view is, is that people know how to spend their money a lot better than Congress or the bureaucrats up in Washington. But, do. but not on bridges, not on roads, not on big infrastructure projects. The banks project wouldn't be moving forward were it not for the stimulus because that funding for the garages was absolutely necessary. The research being done at UC and Children's is being done because of stimulus money. That's not, so, that's not you know, accurate. Individuals, individuals getting tax breaks aren't enough. And our rates are as low as they've been since 1950. Dan. The, okay, the banks and a lot of these other projects were moving along. We got funding for those when I was in Congress. It's not like they were just sitting there and nothing was happening. It was stalled. They used, they used the stimulus bill as an excuse to push a lot of our money out the door. And the, the final analysis is, did it work? The answer is no. We're at 10 well, percent unemployment let, let in Ohio. Let me ask this question. Was it, you know, you cite the uh, uh, unemployment rate. 
was it over promised? You, you're now saying well, maybe. you're saying that it stopped losses of more jobs, but was it over promised? Oh, I think if if you go on the unemployment rate and the promise of the president, I don't know how any president can say this is what the employment unemployment rate will be two years from now. What we do know is that the policies of the Bush administration, the Republican Congress, got us into the worst recession since the 1930s. And we do know that we stopped that recession. We've turned it around. Yeah, the I market want to stay has turned around. If, just one thing, future. if I could. Oh, sure. He said under the Bush administration, I would remind folks that the Democrats took over the House and the Senate two years prior to the economic meltdown and the whole economy going down. So they were in charge. Pelosi and Reid were in, in charge. This is their fourth year right. running the country. Now, let's, uh, uh, I, think, I do think the president has something to do with it. No that. question about okay. it. No question. Let's take a look at those tax mm -hmm. cuts, the Bush tax cuts. There is a, the proposal that's on the table is to let the, those expire on p households that make over $250,000. Keep them in place for households below that. Uh, Steve Shabbat, if you're elected, mm -hmm. where would you stand on that? I think we need to keep the tax cuts in place for everybody. Middle class folks, folks at higher income levels that are creating jobs, everybody. Now, Mr. Driehaus had said that he wasn't quite sure about that before, um, that he'd have to think about it. I'm not sure if he'll have an answer well, today, we'll, we'll but what that. we need to do is we need to keep taxes low on everybody. Again, I believed philosophically to my core that people know how to spend their hard-earned tax dollars better than the government does. Where would you on this concrete proposal? I would support holding taxes down on everybody on their first $250,000 in income. So every American gets a tax break on their first $250,000 in income. But you've got to take the deficit into consideration here. You know, Mr. Shabbat talks about the deficit all the time, but this is $4 trillion over the next 10 years that the government is going to forego. There was a great article in the Financial Times just a little while ago about the millionaires who are getting those tax breaks and where they took their money. The money didn't stay here to create jobs. The money moved overseas. You can't control where those tax breaks stay, and especially for the millionaires. Steve, on this question, is it ever, I mean, the, the Bush tax cuts came early in the Bush administration before 9-11. Mm -hmm. Then we found ourselves in two wars, in Afghanistan and then Iraq, and the, the deficits ballooned. Is it ever permissible to raise the taxes to meet? I mean, that was an unseen mm -hmm. need, but all of a sudden we were spending billions and billions mm -hmm. of dollars, but we didn't pay for it. I think it's a bad time almost always to raise taxes on people. I think it's not, we're not over, we're not undertaxed in this country, we overspend. And that's where you have to work on getting deficits under control is on the spending. Um, now, Mr. Driehaus had mentioned that we, you know, they, they're concerned about the deficit spending. He thinks by raising people's taxes that we're going to do something about the deficit. Under two presidents, we saw just the opposite happen. Under a Democrat, John F. Kennedy, and under a Republican, Ronald Reagan. They reduced taxes substantially, and the revenues coming into the government actually went up because people were keeping more of their own money. They're more okay. efficient at spending it than the government well, is. Look at recent history, Steve. The Bush tax cuts have created a greater deficit. If you look at the deficit, the deficit was created by two unfunded wars, Medicare Part D that wasn't paid for, revenue that fell because of the Bush tax cuts, and then the recession, which is the greatest contributor to the deficit. You've got to get revenues and spending in line. You've got to reduce spending, but you've got to grow the economy and bring revenues up at the same time. You had a balanced budget at the end of the Clinton administration. Rather than paying down the debt for future generations, you went for a political windfall by passing the Bush tax cuts. It was the wrong thing to do for our children. All right, let, let me respond. Um, sure. Steve says that we had a balanced budget under the Clinton administration. I would remind him that for the last six out of the eight years, there was a Republican Congress. That's why we got a balanced budget. We hadn't had a balanced no. budget when the Democrats controlled but, everything for 40 years. But it was, we finally got it balanced and we need to get it back okay. into balance. But it was pre-Bush tax cut revenues. You can't talk about balanced budget you know, unless you're talking about revenues that align with your expenditures. You're talking about <coughs> pre-Bush tax cut revenues. Both parties have been remiss about holding the line on spending. It was that way in, when I was there under Republican control. We should have been a lot more fiscally disciplined. I think if you look at my record, you'll see I was one of the Republicans who actually did hold the lines. But what's happened since the Democrats took over is it's completely out of control well, up there. Huge deficit spending, and we're putting this debt on our kids and grandkids. But something you know, yes, we can see it on 
in the midst of this recession and under the Obama administration and all of this. But in the early part of this decade with those two wars, I mean, that was off budget. A lot of that was mm -hmm. off budget. And it shouldn't have been, you're right. And that was ballooning. And what, you know, what did, Bush was in the White House and in the early years, uh, the Republicans had control. Sure. Where yeah. was the responsibility there? Dan, and people Dan, were calling Dan, for Dan, it. Here's what happened. When President Bush became president, very early in his, his administration, 9-11 happened. And at that point, he was single-mindedly focused on keeping the country safe. And it meant two wars. We could argue about whether we should or shouldn't have gone into either one. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. Right. And, and Homeland Security. Now, with all that additional expenditure, he basically allowed Congress to spend whatever it wants to. And unfortunately, Congress, if you let it run wild, it'll spend that money. And again, a lot of that time was under Republican control. The Democrats did have it for a while there, too. But we need to get fiscal discipline in this country. I'm for a balanced budget constitutional amendment, which re require us to balance the budget just like the states do every year. We actually, after the contract with America back in 94, we passed it, but we lost by one vote over in the Senate. I'd like to see Congress have the discipline to, bu to balance its own budget without that, um, but it's never shown historically that it'll do that. Look, I, I've continually <clears throat> voted against you know, excessive, excessive spending on the Democrat side. The 09 omnibus, the, the 2010 uh, omnibus, you know, and, and so there are a lot of Democrats, especially in the middle, who push for, you know, lower spending uh, and PAYGO. You know, we passed PAYGO legislation saying we should pay for what, you know, we passed. We did that in the health care bill. In the health care bill, we actually reduced the deficit. You know, it, we talk about spending and entitlement spending. We cut entitlement spending in Medicare by $500 billion not by reducing benefits, as Mr. Shabbat would suggest, but by reducing waste, fraud, and abuse, and overpayments to insurance companies. That's the fiscally responsible thing to do, and we've taken that up. Does my party spend too much, and do the, did the Republicans spend too much? Absolutely. And both of us have fought against our parties and to I reduce that, that spending. That both of you D share some yeah. of that, because yeah. uh, you are more yeah, so let me, let me just respond to one thing that Steve said. He said he's consistently voted against the Democrat spending, mm -hmm. and he did vote against the omnibus. I commend him for doing that. I voted against every omnibus up there, but what he didn't say is the big spending bills that he did vote for. The stimulus bill, the $814 billion stimulus bill, which has put us to a considerable degree in this hole, he voted for. The cap and trade uh, global warming uh, new energy tax he voted for. Now that didn't uh, become me, law yet. It didn't become law yet because it didn't pass the Senate, but he voted for it. And then probably most egregiously, voting for this huge new government essential takeover of health care. Now you can argue whether it's a well, takeover we'll or not. To, we'll come to huge that. Huge money, right, but he we'll voted, for, that. He voted for that too. Let me address let's all three. Cap and trade. The stimulus ended the recession, all right? <laughs> so the stimulus has worked. The cap and trade, Mr. Shabbat's running around saying it'll increase people's bills by $1,400. Mm -hmm. I asked him a week and a half ago to show me where that reference came from. He told me he would provide it to me. Nothing. We found out where he got it. It was based on a memo that had nothing to do with the bill that was passed. The actual That's estimate, not true. less than 50 cents You'll a day, you. just in you know rates. However, he doesn't take into account the efficiencies that are gonna be achieved. He doesn't believe global warming is occurring. He doesn't believe well, climate change him, is occurring. Just, well, I'm telling you, because yeah. I've been in many debates. And so they would do nothing and allow the oil companies to dictate our energy policy. I think we've got to step up and do the right thing. The health care bill reduces the deficit. And in the second 10 years, by over a trillion dollars. That's real money, and that's real deficit reduction. We'll come back to the health care bill, but I want to talk about uh, cap and trade. Yeah, it, yeah, several things he said, or I, I wouldn't, they're just not true, ridiculous. What, what? First Wait. of all, he says that I've said global warming doesn't exist. I've never said it doesn't exist. We've got a disagreement to some degree on various studies, on what experts say about who's causing it, how it's being caused. I've never said it doesn't exist. Now, secondly, relative to the study showing that cap and trade, if it becomes law, would increase uh, the average cost of the average American family by anywhere between $1,400 and $1,700. There are study after study after study showing that. Now, if you look at the, the, uh, the World Conservation Organization or some of these very uh, radical environmental, to some degree, uh, environmental organizations, they'll say, oh, well, it's going to reduce costs. But most of the folks agree okay. that it's going to increase costs. Name one study. Yeah, the $1,400. Name one study. There have been a whole that range of them. Steve, I'll give one. them to you. We'll give them to you today. You said that I don't have them here ago. in my pocket. You said it two weeks ago. We yeah, still are waiting right. for yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Can you cite one? Absolutely. We've got, them, we've got them all over there. Name one. Yeah. Right here. Okay. There, there have been a ton of them, Steve. Exactly. A ton of them. I have to take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about health care, which is a much calmer topic. <laughs> Stay tuned. After the break, Mr. Greenhouse and Mr. Shavitt will return.
Welcome back. I am joined this morning by the candidates for Congress in Ohio's 1st Congressional District. Uh, the current incumbent is Democrat Steve Driehaus and the challenger, Republican Steve Shabbat. Welcome back. Okay, <laughs> let's go to health care. Steve, mm -hmm. probably nothing that occurred in this last Congress got people more upset. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of some people, not all people, some people got some people upset than the health care reform bill. Do you have any second thoughts about the bill that was passed? No. Uh, I find that people that are upset are upset about the misinformation. They're upset when they describe it as the government takeover of health care or Obamacare. When you talk about the specific proposals that were passed, that is not allowing insurance companies to uh, to discriminate because you have a pre-existing condition, not allowing, not allowing insurance companies to cut you off because you get sick, finally paying for the promise that Congress made in Medicare Part D and paying for the pharmaceutical coverage for seniors, making sure that seniors can go to the doctor and they don't have a co-payment for a well visit, so they're not making choices between a doctor visit and food on the table, and making sure that children can stay on their parents' plans until they're 26 years old. These are all very positive things, making sure that you can go out on an exchange and purchase affordable quality health care in a competitive marketplace. These are good things. When people understand the components of the health care bill, they're very supportive. When it's described in some other way, but they're have, not supportive. Have the Democrats been done a bad job at describing that? Oh, the Republicans are so much better at messaging than the Democrats. You know, they say death panels. We talk about end of life care death panels. You know, we talk about, you know, reducing the deficit. They'll say, all oh, this will bankrupt us. There's no information, there's no facts to back up what they're saying, but, you know, the message works. Steve. I hope people were listening to what Mr. Driehaus is saying here. He's essentially saying, uh, in, and I think a very condescending uh, manner towards the American people, that it's not <laughs> the bill that's bad. It couldn't possibly be that the people did understand the bill and didn't like it. It has to be that the American people just didn't understand it. We haven't been educated enough by Nancy Pelosi or this Congress. The people from the start, uh, didn't like this bill by pretty significant percentages and they thought if they rammed it through then they would get some credit for it, people would like it. There isn't a Democrat in the country that's running positive ads about the health care bill saying I voted for it, I'm proud of it. They're all running away from it. The only Democrats that are running ads around the country are saying I voted against it trying to save their seats. It was a terrible bill. Do we need to do well, that's something? That's why with... I asked Steve that question, though. Uh, mm -hmm. Did he still support? Mm -hmm. Did he regret what he did? And yeah. his answer was no. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I, that's forget right. the ads for a moment. That, that was re why I asked that question I, I, that way. He, he did say that. Um, yeah, did we need to reform health care? Absolutely. There's a lot of things that we should have done try to reduce the cost, which this bill didn't do. For example, medical malpractice reform. Uh, for example, association health plans allowing small businesses to join together so they can negotiate with the insurance companies to keep their rates down. A bill that I had introduced called the Healthcare Affordability Act, which would allow every person to fully deduct their health care premiums from their taxes. Those are the types of things that actually made sense. Instead, they pushed through this okay. huge, expensive, almost trillion dollar bill that we're going to be paying for for years if we Look, can't okay. stop it. Steve. A bunch of false arguments. You know, medical malpractice has been passed in the state of Ohio and other states. It hasn't reduced the cost of health care. And so I think it's important to understand this, this idea of associations. Well, we now have the largest pool that a small business can buy into. It's called the state of Ohio. That's a huge insurance pool to reduce the risk. You know, 50% of small businesses in Ohio can't even offer health insurance because it's too expensive right now under the existing system. This is about reforming that existing system. And for the first time, those small businesses can get tax breaks if they are providing health insurance to their employees. That's a step in the right direction for small businesses. Steve, two weeks ago, I had uh, Congressman Jean Schmidt on, on the show, mm -hmm. and she said that if the Republicans take control, they will, uh, the approach will be to repeal the health care law. I'd just like to point out on a practical level, even if the Republicans get control of the House, and even if they got control of the Senate, the margins aren't going to be so big that they're going to be able to over overcome a veto. Mm -hmm. So realistically, there isn't going to be any repeal. Yeah. So what do you do? What would you do if you get elected? Yeah, well, if we did, let's say we took both houses and we did pass a repeal, President Obama then will be faced with a, with a challenge, whether he'll work with the Congress to try to improve the bill uh, or whether he'll just out and out veto it. Now, if he vetoes it, uh, a lot of these things don't take effect till next year or the next year or the next year. So a lot of things don't happen immediately. 
Um, the strategy is, and I've been talking to a number of people about what's the best way to do this, is to not fund the implementation of the bill through the appropriations process. The bureaucracy can't carry out a lot of this stuff um, if they don't have the money to do so. And then what will happen is that will be one of the key issues in the next presidential election, which is right around the corner here. And hopefully we can get rid of this bill, which the American people don't want, want that they basically cram down their throats, and actually pass good legislation, which will get the American people quality, affordable health care. He was there for 14 years. They act as if they were never there, as if they were never in charge. They say we need to improve the health care system, yet they never did it. They didn't do anything to address pre-existing conditions. You know, they passed Medicare Part D and didn't even fund it. So there is no intention on the part of the Republicans to improve the system. That's not they true. just want to gut the system, go back to the health insurance companies making decisions as to whether or not you can get coverage and allowing them to reap huge profits out of the system. What of the things that Steve Driehaus ticked off at the beginning here about uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, Part D, uh, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, do you support or not support some of those specific things that the, the Democrats point out all the time? Yeah, there are some things within the bill that I do think were okay, a good idea. what are they specifically? Well, for example, allowing people to have their uh, college-age kids stay on their insurance longer than they are Until right 26. now. So whether it ought to be mm -hmm. 26 or 25 or 27, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, that's things. But right, yeah. that's something I think they were right to do that. Um, I think it was right to m move forward in the area of pre-existing conditions. I don't think that a person who, for example, has diabetes or some other chronic type illness should be unable to get health care. So that was a good idea. But what the Democrats did in this process is they essentially didn't make it bipartisan. They shut out the Republicans, essentially didn't let them offer any amendments to the bill, uh, maybe at the committee time, but not on the floor. And then they rammed this thing through with all these. And the other thing that was so outrageous to the American people was literally buying Votes, especially over in the, in the Senate, the, the Cornhusker kickback, the Louisiana <laughs> purchase, and, and all that stuff. Now, Steve will say, oh, well, we took that okay. stuff out. But that did. process is one of the main reasons that the American people were so turned off. That plus the bill Real is awful. Real quick, because I got one more topic. I was there. Many, many Republican amendments in the bill. The bill looks very similar to Mitt Romney's plan uh, up in Massachusetts. There were many Republican ideas incorporated into the legislation. Were the votes there at the end of the day? No. But many Republican ideas incorporated into the okay. Okay. I want to go to one last topic, which isn't part of the conversation right now in this campaign, as far as I can tell. And we'll, uh, I think I'll start with you, Steve. Okay. Uh, that is the future of Social Security. Mm -hmm. 78 million uh, baby boomers, me being one of them, mm -hmm. are going to reach retirement age, changing the demographics in this country. It's going to overload that system. We've known it for decades. We haven't done anything about it. What are you? We're going to have to do something. What do you think we're going to have to do? Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do, which he's been saying and running ads saying that I'm for privatizing Social Security. That's not accurate at all. I have said that people ought to be able to voluntarily, if they want to, put a couple of percent aside in a personal savings account so they would have Social Security and this account, which over time, 30, 40, 50 years, would probably grow larger, then they'd have both in their retirement. Then also, if a person dies, they'd actually have something to take with them. Now, the, the greatest threat to Social Security is the fact that they're spending money like crazy in Washington right now, and the debt is so huge. Social Security is one of those things which in, is in that pot of money that they're not going to be able to fund if they don't get okay. the spending under control. So I'm in favor well, of the Social Security okay. Preservation Act. To, sure. Look. Uh, the trust fund is in good shape until the 2030s. Uh, we have worked hard to make sure that that's the case. Steve repeatedly voted to go into the trust fund and take money out, you know, to gut the Social Security trust fund. He says he's not for privatization, and then he defines privatization. That is taking money that would otherwise go to the Social Security trust fund and allow people to invest it in their own private accounts on the stock park market. What a disaster that would have been in 2008. But that is the definition of the privatization of Social Security, and that's what he continues to support. John Boehner would take it a step further. The guy that he supports for Speaker would push the Republican members of the House to push for the total privatization of Social Security, and many of his Republican colleagues would move in that direction. I'd remind people that he voted for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker. Against so, John Boehner, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and now yeah. he's come out just yesterday okay. and said, I'm not sure if I'd support her again or not. We'll, Depends we'll, who's yeah. running. But against John Boehner, who supports the okay. privatization of Social Security and the gunning of Medicare, get, you, you don't get to it. vote against each other's parties. <laughs> it's, it, that's a false. Okay, thank you for being here, sure, okay. as thank always. You. Uh, uh, if you want to roll ahead, I just want to remind people that 
uh, all of our coverage for the campaign is online at our new website, local12.com. Just click Programs and Newsmakers, and there you'll see all of our last eight weeks of coverage with candidates and various races from all the counties locally. Also, be sure to join us on Tuesday night here on Local 12 for the best election night coverage any place. At 7.30, Paula Toti and I will be streamed live from the Hamilton County Board of Elections online, and then we'll join the 10 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news. Most important, vote this Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. Have a good week.